Uh, now we have Kathy Rastu from London. We are very happy. I am very, very, very happy about this because as a regular phonetician, we considered uh, the spoken language not only to be the real language, but the only language, you know, exaggerating. You are when you are a student, you think that the subject you are studying is the one. Okay, but by these times, I was wondering all the time how is reading taking place? I mean, how do we? understand language through reading uh is it like a photograph directly to the brain or is it is it going through a phonetic processing morphological and so forth well about those things i've been wondering for many many years and now lately i thought what are we doing we have neglected reading, of course, and writing. I mean to say, those things, reading and writing, uh, they are the basis of our society. I mean, we have our documents. Uh, and it's outside our sphere. I mean, the one outside my world and the ex link. And then I desperately uh, thought that, no, we have to do something about this. And here we are. We have Kathy. We will be very, very happy to hear what she has to say and of course uh we will we won't have the time for many questions as i would like uh to ask but uh we will have her for about 40 minutes uh so kathy please uh join and start your keynote Thank you very much. Um, I'm really honored to be able to open this meeting um, and speak to you about some of my work. Um, and I was really looking forward to coming to the meeting to Athens, not only for the pleasure of coming to Athens, but I was hoping that I would meet some people who know something about writing systems and the evolution of writing. So if you are one of those people and you're listening, please get in touch. Let's see if I can make this work. Hmm, that's not good. I can't advance my slides. There we go. Now, can you see the slide now? Is that good? You don't see my notes. You see the slide. Good, that's okay. Fine. Good, thank you. So today I'm going to talk about how the way that we write influences our capacity for reading. I want to start by looking at some ancient writing, as I find ancient writing fascinating, but it also reminds us that writing is a relatively recent cultural invention, and reading, unlike spoken language, is a learned skill. So on the left, we see writing with no spacing between words. So at this time, writing was a direct representation of spoken language, and what reading was was uh, it, it involved laborious, overt translation back to sound. But on the right, we see spacing and other graphic conventions. Now, why did these innovations emerge? And how did they influence how we read? Now, these innovations are actually very interesting because what they do is they reduce the extent to which writing reflects spoken language. There are no spaces or capital letters in spoken language. 
And some argue that these innovations had fairly dramatic consequences for how we read. And that is to say they made it possible for us to have skilled silent reading as we know today. And one theme that I want to present today is that written language represents spoken language, but it's its own thing. It needs to be studied in its own right. It carries information that is not in the spoken signal. And that's important for reading. Now, why might that be? Might, why might it carry information that's not in the spoken signal? Well, the reason is that when we speak, we have intonation, we have gesture, we have audiovisual cues, and no matter how tight the link between symbols, visual symbols, and sounds, those things will always be absent in text. And so I think that writing needs to carry more information than just the sounds of words if it's to be effective in driving rapid skilled reading. So writing allows us to access language through the visual modality. And precisely how we do that depends on the writing system. The writing systems are all expressions of spoken language, but they vary considerably. So on the left here, we've got Korean. So this is a recent made up system, an invented system, and it provides virtually a one-to-one -one mapping between symbols and sounds. Right? And you can see that the letters themselves are shaped in terms of the articulatory configuration that would be needed to produce those letters. So Korean offers a direct line into spoken language. Chinese is very different. So we have Chinese, there is some capacity for generalization in Chinese, but learning to read in Chinese is a painstaking process of learning the meanings of each of these individual characters. Braille is again different. So here we have the Braille cell of raised dots, and that Braille cell can represent letters or clusters of letters or even whole words. And that's got implications for reading. And finally, the Roman alphabet is used to transcribe many languages, although the transparency with which letters map to sounds is very different across those languages. So if we want to understand how the brain learns to read, we need to start with the information that is being learned. And that's the information in writing. And there's another very interesting point about writing systems. And that is that we are still developing writing systems all the time for political reasons. For example, there's an Inuit system that was developed just last year to increase accessibility in the case of pinyin and braille and to increase the speed of transmission of information, as in shorthand. And if we knew more about how the way that we write influences how we read, then we might understand more about what makes a writing system optimal. So reading acquisition is about building a mapping between arbitrary visual symbols and spoken language, uh, discovering through instruction and experience how your writing system communicates meaning. And research suggests that this is achieved through two pathways, one that links spellings directly to meanings and one that links spellings to meanings via sound-based codes. And the extent to which we use either of those pathways should depend on the writing system. So I'm gonna to talk today about some of the research I've done to discover how that mapping between visual symbols and spoken language is achieved in English. Okay, so when children come to the problem of learning to read, they have pretty good knowledge of spoken language. And so the challenge is to learn to map those arbitrary visual symbols onto the sounds and meanings of spoken language. And we've got two choices for how that occurs but those choices are not equivalent. So we have the direct mapping between spelling and meaning, and you can see that that's highly arbitrary. If we take words that are similar in look, so cut, cat, and can, those look similar, but they're not similar in meanings. Right? And we don't expect them to be similar in meanings because we have an alphabetic writing system. Now, if we were to learn that mapping between spelling and meaning, that would require children to memorize each word. And humans are very bad at that type of learning. And given the extent of the vocabulary in English, which is vast, children on average in the first year of reading instruction encounter about 26 new words per school day. That would be wholly unfeasible. 
So in contrast, the mapping between spelling and sound is relatively systematic. If we have words like cut, can, and cat, and can, they look similar and they also sound similar. That's why initial reading instruction in English and in other alphabetic writing systems focuses on teaching this mapping between spelling and sound. And this form of instruction is known as phonics. And so the learning of this mapping allows a child to access meaning from print via their oral language knowledge. And up to about the age of seven, reading comprehension is almost totally explained by a child's ability to decode spelling to sound and their oral language. And that spelling to sound translation turns out to be really important also for adult skilled readers. And that is self-evident by the fact that you can read this sign. Yet just like the ancient readers, translation from spelling to sound is slow and it's attention demanding, even for adults. And there's also special problems that English raises because the mapping between spelling and sound is imperfect. So we can see, uh, we can illustrate the consequences of that imperfect relationship by looking at how adults read um, non-words. So we, this is a, a study that we did a, a few years ago and we brought about 41 adults into the lab and asked them to read 915 non-words like, like you see there. And the reason that we have people read non-words is that it tells us something about what people have learned about the relationship between spelling and sound over their 20 odd years of reading experience. And what we found was that there was considerable variation in pronunciation. Some of the non-words like uh, bamper elicited only one pronunciation across all participants. Others like iluck or ilutch, we got 22 different pronunciations. And that was the case also within participants. So given a certain letter, how would an individual participant pronounce that? Well, that varied considerably for some of those letters. And when we looked at that variation, we found that it was strongly attributable to the regularities in the writing system, right? So if you break these non-words down into smaller parts, what you find is that the consistency with which those parts map onto sounds, that determines how much variation we saw. So for letter sound combinations that are very inconsistent, or there's a lot of variation across subjects and within subjects. So in effect, the spelling sound knowledge that people have acquired over 20 years or so of reading experience is a mirror of the writing system. And what we can also say is that even after all of that experience, there is considerable uncertainty in English in that spelling sound mapping. And so I think it's not a viable means to drive rapid skilled reading. And so consequently, Becoming a skilled reader in English and other languages ultimately requires us to learn this mapping between spelling and meaning. And remember that this is not an innate mapping. This is having to map parts of the brain that deal with objects and faces onto meaningful spoken language, right? And that's hard. Learning of that mapping takes many years and requires massive text experience. So what is it that readers are learning through all of that text experience? Well, I began by saying that in the initial part of reading instruction, when you're reading very short words, that mapping between spelling and meaning tends to be arbitrary, right? So it's very difficult to learn. The situation changes when we think about words with more than one morpheme, right? And in fact, even though English is not considered to be a morphologically rich language, um, most words in English are morphologically complex, as is the case in other languages. Now, morphology is very important because what it provides are islands of regularity in this mapping between spelling and meaning. And those islands of regularity arise because stems like clean occur and reoccur in words with similar meanings, such as unclean, cleaner, and cleanly. And affixes alter the meanings of words in highly predictable ways. So you can see that the ER is uh, forming an agentive, playing an agentive role in teacher, builder, and cleaner. And there's a very interesting trade-off here between spelling sound and spelling meaning regularity. So if we look at these three words, busted, snored, and kicked, we see immediately 
that those words are in the past. And we know that they're in the past because they end in ed, right? Now, the funny thing is that those words, ed, is pronounced differently in each of those words. It's pronounced ed, d, and t, right? So that's inconsistent. If we wanted English to be a more faithful transcription of the spoken language, it'd be spelled uh, as I've spelled here on the slide, busted, snored, and kicked. But we would lose that meaningful information about past tense status. So we sacrifice spelling sound transparency to retain this meaningful information in the writing. And in recent computational work published just this year in Cognition, we've shown that this trade-off between spelling sound and spelling meaning regularity is a general principle of English writing. So these are two examples here. The first on the left is the sound sequence word final lus. And then next to it on the right is word final ickle. And you can see in both cases that there's many ways to spell this, right? So you can spell less as lace or less or lice. And if you've ever tried to teach a child to spell in English, probably the same in other languages, I mean, it's a complete, um, you know, it's, it's uh, crazy, right? And what happens is people go to school, children go to school, and they come home with these lists that they have to memorize, right? It's just a, it's a minefield. But when we look at, at the grammatical class of some of these spellings, what we see is that this disorder, out of this emerges order, right? So if we look at word final less, there's many ways to spell it, but there's only one way to spell it if it's an adjective, right? And if it's an adjective, it must be spelled as L-E-S-S, -S, right? Same for ickle. Many ways to spell it, but there's only one way to spell it if it's an adjective, right? Like I see hands going. That's, hopefully that's good. Only one way to spell it, right? And what I find really interesting about this is that this information is not available in the spoken language, right? All of these spellings sound the same in the spoken language. The disambiguating information comes in the spelling. And that must have consequences for reading. Right? Now, just as an aside, one might ask why English evolved in this way, right? So English hasn't really been reformed. The spelling reforms haven't taken off. Um, and English could have evolved in a way that prioritized spelling sound transparency. It could have gotten more faithful to the spoken language, but it didn't. And just like the development of word, word spacing, I would like to suggest that perhaps English spelling evolved in this way because it allows us to take in more information more rapidly through vision. So this slide just shows you all 154 English suffixes. And what you can see is that morphology is highly visible in English spelling, right? English is not a morphologically rich language, but morphology is highly visible in the spelling. And the first graph there simply shows that most English suffix spellings are highly diagnostic of grammatical class. And in fact, those at the top there, that means it's 100%. It's a slam dunk for grammatical class. And most suffix spellings, provide the only means of expressing a sound sequence for a particular grammatical category. And what this means, to put it another way, is that if you look at a suffixed English word, you can decide on the basis of a very cursory analysis whether that word is an entity, a property, or an act, right, right away. And that must be pretty interesting for reading. So I've established that English offers highly reliable information regarding meaning. Now the discovery of this information is important for learning, right? So what I have here on the right are 15 different words. But if you know about morphology, those are actually all the same word. They're all variations of the same word, right? And in fact, if you look at the average 20 year old in English can recognize about 70,000 printed words, but if you know about morphology and you sort of count, get rid of all the inflections and derivations, that turns into 11,000. So learning that mapping becomes dramatically easier if you know something about morphology. And it turns out that skilled readers use this information in reading and spelling. So this is a very simple uh, study that we did where we simply asked skilled readers to classify non-words as an adjective or a noun, right? And we gave them these non-words like domus and jixlet, terish, rabness. Now, I can guarantee you, 
that none of our participants that we tested was ever taught the relationship between suffixes and grammatical class. Right? In fact, we usually need to tell our participants what a noun and an adjective is, right? So they don't know this explicitly. And yet, when we give them these non-words with suffixes like this, Participants are more likely to classify those non-words as adjectives when they have a suffix that's associated with nouns, or so with, with adjectives, than with nouns. Right? And you can see on the right that the strength of that effect is graded by the salience of the, of the suffix. So the more adjective-y a suffix is, the more likely participants are to classify it as an adjective. Right? And the more a suffix is associated with nouns, the less likely people are to, to classify these non-words as adjectives. And in a paper that we just published, we showed that these effects seem to be stronger in participants with higher vocabulary and better spelling ability, indicating that those that have more text experience have sort of absorbed these cues from the writing system and are using them in their uh, performance. Now, this is kind of a metalinguistic task, you know, is it a noun, is it an adjective? Um, but we find these same effects both in spelling and in eye tracking. So when people are given a non word like domus, spelled in this way, and it's put in an adjective state, in an adjective context, they're less likely to spend a lot of time on that non word and regress back to that non word than if it's put into a noun context. So something about these subjects, they know that that OUS is associated with adjectives and not nouns. So like the case for spelling sound knowledge, the spelling meaning knowledge that our participants have acquired over 20 odd years of reading experience seems to mirror the information in the writing system. Right? So they've picked that up. Now the story gets more surprising because it turns out that skilled readers use this information in a really counterintuitive way. So these are some ERP data from a, a study we conducted a few years ago. And all we asked adults to do was just to read single printed words. And these printed words varied in their morphological properties. Right? So some of the words were non-morphological, like shovel, right? Not morphological. Some were morphologically complex, like teacher. The critical condition were these words like corner, which look like they could be morphological, but they're not, right? A corner is not someone who corns. And what we found when we just asked people to read these non-words is we found that in 100, within 190 milliseconds, that there seemed to be a segmentation based on the appearance of morphological complexity. So you can see on the left-hand side of the plot, the black uh, line is diverging from the other two lines, right? So the black line is the, the non-morphological line. So the, the reading system is treating teacher and corner in the same way. So there's a segmentation. 60 minute, milliseconds later, when we think that semantic information um, is being activated, what we see is a big positivity for the corner items. So that's that green line. That's, uh, that's going positive in the middle of the plot. And what we think is happening here is that participants are segmenting these items based on their apparent morphological structure. And then there's a kind of a correction for these corner items. Now these data are consistent now with a wealth of priming and neural priming data indicating that we're pulling apart these items in order to find meaning very rapidly. And our, our evidence from our lab and other labs indicates that these effects seem to be stronger um, for readers with greater skill and experience. For example, we don't see this pattern until late adolescence in, in readers. So here we have a rapid, very superficial analysis that helps readers access the meanings of words very quickly. It arises in individuals with substantial text experience and it only works because of the nature of the writing system, right? So people say, why would you do this with something like corner? Well, the point is that corner is a true exception, right? Corner would typically be spelled a different way, as in martyr, right? So there aren't very many words like this. The writing system makes sure of it, right? So we see 
that the way that the brain has solved the problem of reading is a reflection of the writing system and your experience with it. Right, so, so far I've talked about this highly salient information that readers use um, to build this spelling to meaning direct pathway, and they use it very rapidly in word recognition. I want to just provide some evidence that this is central to this spelling meaning pathway. So what we did is we got 45 adults and we took a behavioral measure of their sensitivity to these units in reading. And then we conducted a diffuse and tensor imaging scan. And we sent those scans over to Michal ben Shaha's lab in Tel Aviv. Um, and she worked with her student, Maya Yablonski, to analyze those data. And this is published in Cortex last year. So what you can see is that they, tr they traced the fiber pathways for this spelling to sound root, and those are the blue and green pathways, and then the spelling to meaning root, and those are the orange, yellow, and red pathways. And they looked to see whether sensitivity to morphemic information is correlated with the diffusion properties of those white matter pathways. And what they found was that there were significant correlations, but only in the spelling to meaning pathways in the left hemisphere. And that relationship held after controlling for a number of variables. And you can see those correlations here. So what that shows, it's not causal evidence, but it shows that variation in morphological knowledge in these English adults readers is associated with diffusion properties of the ventral white matter pathway. That's the spelling to meaning pathway. And that's consistent with what we know from MEG and fMRI. So I think that this morphemic information might be really critical to developing that fast mapping between spelling and meaning. Now I want to make one more point in my talk, but before I do, I'll just, I'll just give a little bit of an interim summary. And that is that I've talked about spelling sound and spelling meaning regularities in English writing. And I've given you some evidence that those regularities are mirrored in the adult reading system. And I've shown that the sensitivity to those regularities seems to be a function of reader skill and experience. So in effect, the reading system is the writing system. Now I want to just take a few minutes and think a little bit about text as opposed to single words. So this is a passage from one of the national reading exams in England and children take these at the end of primary school when they're aged 10 or 11. So just have a little look at this passage. So I hope that you can see in this passage that the text is using richer vocabulary and more complicated syntax than we would expect from children of the same age in their spoken language, right? So we have phrases like a great generosity of space, they're talking about the harvests of a bygone age, the poignant smells. You know, and when my daughter was 10, she wasn't talking like this on the playground, right? And I think that this is interesting because we've ended up packing a huge amount of information into text, right? How has this arisen, right? How has this in 2000 years gone from just translating the, the written material into spoken language into being able to pack so much information into text. And I think it, it relates to something about the efficiency of accessing language through vision and the way that writing systems help us to do that. And I think that what's really fascinating, I mean, talking to some linguists um, who always talk about spoken language, you know, being the the be all and end all. This is what language is, right? And when we talk about literate individuals and their language knowledge, most of that language knowledge is coming from text, right? And this is what they're getting, right? They're getting information in text coming to them through vision. It's different from spoken language. Right, so I'm gonna finish up now, um, so we have time for questions. So what I've told you is that writing is a form of information allows us to experience language through vision. And I've told you that the reading system, in effect, is the writing system. Information 
Stored in the skilled reading system is a mirror of the writing system. So when we think about reading, we first off need to think about writing. Right? And I've tried to say that spoken language is a represent, uh, writing is a representation of spoken language, but writing is its own thing, right? It carries different information to spoken language. And I think, and I, I want to find out more about this, I think that that is at the heart of our capacity for rapid skilled reading. Um, so thank you for listening. These are my lab who do all the work and my funders. Um, thank you very much. So now I don't know what to do with my screen. Should I try to take some questions? Yes, please. They can raise hand in the participants tab. Oh, okay. Oh, the participants. We can tab. accept questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Let me see if I can see the. Oh, I can't we, see we, any hands. We can raised. monitor it. Um, Michael Paradovsky, please. Sorry, it's uh, taken away. Uh, thank you. This was a really uh, an excellent uh, talk. Um, now, I was wondering, because you naturally referred to the Chinese characters, whether you'd say that there are any differences in the processing of uh, reading in Chinese, where, of course, the characters also encode semantic information, but uh, also phonological information. Uh, so, any differences between the processing of Chinese characters and uh, an alphabetic system, such as English, if um, you know uh, relevant research? Thank you. Yeah, so I think that um, Chinese, first of all, there's a, an interesting issue about whether you've learned Chinese using pinyin, which is an alphabetic system that's also spaced. And so, you know, there's not a lot of research on how that influences your reading of Chinese. But I think, you know, in the case of Chinese, th there is capacity for semantic and phonological generalization in Chinese, but it's weak, right? So you have to know many, many characters to be able to take advantage of those systematicities. So to a great extent, it's about memorizing individual characters. And that is a painstaking and long process. And the only reason that it's even viable in Chinese is that you need to know many fewer characters for full literacy then you need to know, say, in English or Italian or French or Spanish, right? So if you know about 4,000 characters, that's sufficient for full literacy, right? So that's not even sufficient for the first year of reading instruction in, in English. So I think that um, it, it is viable to learn those as individual units um, in, in a way that wouldn't be viable for an alphabetic writing system. Um, and, and I think, you know, there's not been that much research on, on the division of labor between these pathways in Chinese. There's research by Charles Perfetti, which shows that they, people do access the sounds of these once they're skilled readers. Um, but, you know, there needs to be more research looking at the division of labor between these two pathways. But I think, in, a, in effect, it, it is very different than learning a system like English, simply because in English, you're, you're having to take advantage of uh, the capacity for generalization uh, through the spelling sound knowledge. Thank you. Oh. Are there other hands? I don't see any other hands in the participants tab. Well, I, I, I'd like, I'd like to put a question. Is is it all right? Do you hear me? Yeah. Yes, Professor Botinis. Yes. Okay. Well, I have two questions, which I've been thinking for many years. The one I'm coming back to my initial, uh, what I what I said before. Let's say when we put focus, a lot of focus, emphasis, not a small focus. Uh, usually when we speak, there is 
some activity on the brain, extra activity. The question is, when we read, and uh, some word is underlined or whatever, that is to say, uh, the writer wants to indicate focus and a strong focus, and we read, would that have a reflection on our brain? Would be something extra, a spike, which means that we read and interpret it in functional phonological units or so, or is it pictures directly to the brain? What would you say? Okay, I don't know quite what you mean by emphasis. Do you mean like a... It was Helene, non, not Maria, who wrote the letter. Okay, and if you do that in writing? Yes. Or... Yeah, well, I, you know, there's a lot of research on, on uh, predictability in text reading, using ERPs, for example, um, and people are very sensitive to predictability um, in a way, for example, that um, accords very nicely with some of these uh, deep learning language models. Um, I, I, am, I am not so sure about the sort of emphasis that you're talking about there, how you denote that in writing, simply through the, the words? Well, uh, <laughs> yes, because uh, emphasis may have different expressions, even meaning. When, when the reader reads something, I mean, they put emphasis where reading emphasis. We would call it, now we came with terminology. Uh, I mean to say, a reader may read emphasis in a word which is attracting in a way, but another reader may not, probably. Yeah, well, I think that this is a really, it's a really interesting difference between reading and spoken language. As I said at the beginning, that so much of spoken language is is beyond the sound, right? So you can say it was Helene, you know, not Maria, right? And it's very difficult to do that in writing, you know, unless you use italics or bold or something. And there's very little research on 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 the impact of those types of graphic conventions. Yes. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, th I think it's it, it's interesting. And and in, in in a way, this is why I say that the sort of information that's in in written language, you know, most of the study of reading has been all about how we translate written language letters into abstract phoneme representations, thinking that that is spoken language. Well, that is not spoken language, right? That's part of spoken language. And it's not enough to drive something that works so rapidly as skilled reading. Um, I think it's a, it's a very interesting question, how we use some of these graphic conventions, even things like line breaks, right? So if you try to do poetry, and make the line breaks in the wrong place. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a complete disaster, right? But there's very little, you know, we focus on, you know, single words or highly controlled sentences, but uh, I'd like to do some of that work. That sounds very interesting. Well, I hope we will talk about those things more in the mm. future. I mean, mm. maybe there is, there are other people who would like to ask. If they are not, Kathy, I have one small question more, but let's, Let's see if other people would like to ask. Uh, <clears throat> Julia Sparch is also waiting. Julia, please, you can unmute and, and ask your question. Yes, hi, can you hear me? Yes, good. Perfect, thanks for the talk. Um, we've done a little bit research on auditory morphological perception. Mm -hmm. And one of the effects that we found was that different allomorphic variants were were clustered together in processing. So whether, for example, it's a voiced uh, plural inflection or voiceless inflection, they were processed very similarly. And I was wondering if you think that could also have something to do with the writing convention, namely that they are all represented by the same letter in, in writing. Well, I don't know the answer to that, but it's a very interesting hypothesis. And I'm 
I, I've been very interested in the idea that, you know, how does writing shape spoken language knowledge? And at the very foundation, you know, you've got this issue that in spoken language, you know, the realization of a speech sound varies so considerably across contexts and across speakers. But in writing, you've got this radical form invariance, right? So it's always the same letter. And that letter maps on to all these different realizations of a phoneme. And I just wonder the extent to which learning about letters then helps you to, to cluster this, these phonemes together that you would have heard in so many different contexts to know that they're the same thing. And I think that that's a kind of analogy to what you're saying, right? You're saying that these um, inflections are denoted by the same visual symbol. So it's almost like visually guided auditory learning, right? Mm -hmm. Perceptual learning. I, I don't know. I mean, it seems like it's possible. Um, I guess that a way to test that would be to look at people who have varying levels of reading experience, right? So does it happen, be very difficult because their morphology knowledge also is, is different, but if you could vary text experience and you found that um, those effects were different for people without so much text experience, and I guess that would give you some evidence for that hypothesis. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, because obviously the first thing we thought was that they have an underlying representation that maps them together. But that's why I thought your talk was really interesting to like reverse it and see if maybe um, it's more the written side that influences that clustering. Mm, thank yeah. you. And I think there's many reasons. I mean, I even, you know, there, there's this wonderful book by um, Sanger. Sanger is his name mm -hmm. in Chicago. He, he wrote the, the book Spaces Between Words. And he talks about how the introduction of spacing actually changes what a spoken word means, right? Because you're not used to having individual words in spoken continuous speech. So what does the fact of having spaced text do to that spoken language representation? I think it's fascinating questions. Great, thank you. So we still have five more minutes if someone wants uh, to answer a quick question. If not, Professor Botinis, you have another question? Yes, thank you, thank you. Well, uh, about reading, uh, I mean, the units of perception or understanding or comprehension in reading, which are the units? It's a basic question and how do we perceive? I mean to say, when we speak, we plan very much ahead because many times we hadn't planned well and we are doing resettings because we are out of breath or whatever. That's sure for speaking. When for writing, we cannot, I, I assume, we cannot write word by word. We have some paragraph length in mind and we write sentence wise using words one after the other. Well, when we come to reading now uh, about us for phoneticians and phonologists, syllable is though it is the most basic unit, it's often disregarded and people go to morphine. I mean to say, I would suppose as in, 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 in listening, there should be some shorter memory until we reach a longer memory in order to understand what is written. So what would you say about this? And how far ahead do we see? Do we go in reading forth and back? Or is it window wise? What would you think? A, a okay. philosophical issue, not a research one, maybe. So the, let me answer the units question first. And I think that people have been for many years chasing the units of visual word perception. And I, I'm not sure that that's a fruitful line of work. 
I think that people use whatever information in reading is, is salient, right? They use clusters of these letters, they use clusters of letters, they use these morphemes if it buys them something, right? So they use morphemes because it's a highly reliable cue to meaning, at least in English, right? They, they use letters because it's a highly reliable cue to sound, right? So if, if it were the case that some kind of orthographic syllable were able to supersede that, then I think people would use that. And there's some evidence that people use uh, onsets and bodies, so onsets and rhymes, uh, in reading because that gives you greater consistency, greater systematicity across that spelling sound pathway, right? But I think it will depend on the writing system, what units or what types of information um, is, is useful to get to the meaning and get to the meaning quickly, right? Um, as, a, as a question of looking ahead, this is really interesting because, you know, people like me, I study single word perception. I hardly ever would go outside the, the single word, right, to, to look at a whole sentence, my God. Um, and people who tend to, to study discourse and sentences don't tend to look at single word processes. But we've just completed a series of experiments where we've looked at letter level processing, so basic orthographic processing in the context of sentences and sentences of different types of predictability. And what we find is that that perception of that basic information changes radically when you put them in sentences of varying degrees of predictability. So if you have a highly predictable sentence, you basically adopt a very, very low threshold for the analysis of visual information. You hardly look at it at all. And it's even hard to get people to, to, to process, process that information properly, right? So they make a lot of mistakes. Um, if you end up giving somebody a highly predictable sentence, and then you give them a word that they didn't expect, and there, there's huge inaccuracy. Um, so I think it, there is a, a lot of research left to do between single word people and the kind of sentence level, higher level people, to understand how that, those contextual influences influence that bottom-up processing. Um, I guess the other thing that I would say is that, um, you know, about these units, We've been looking at this a little bit in the brain using these new methods called representational similarity analysis, which enables you to look at how the brain, the, the types of similarity that different areas of the brain like. And what we can see is, is a kind of posterior to anterior gradient um, going from very veridical letter level coding um, and moving on to more abstract phonological and semantic co coding as you go further forward. And you get more invariant coding as well, right? So you, you, you allow letters in different positions as you go further forward. So I think that that's another fruitful line which new methods might be able to help us with that question of what kind of units are useful. But I think it does depend on the writing system. Kathy, thank you very much indeed. It was a great pleasure to have you with us and I do hope we will continue our discussion. We have a lot of things to talk about. Thank you. Bye-bye. Good. Next time in Athens. <laughs>